Welcome back to We Play Games. I'm Walker, and here we are inside our basic country guide series about to discuss Dai Nam. So Dai Nam has had a really tumultuous past couple of decades with the rise of the Nguyen, the Nguyen Dynasty, but also the Taesun Rebellion, um, the emergence of a massive amount of piracy in Southeast Asia. There's a lot of great videos that are part of the China History Podcast. I'll link a couple of them down in the description. Um, but the, the history here locally is really fun and very cool. Um, but fortunately, you have a pretty large population relative to everybody else. There's around 30 to 35 million pops in the, the Southeast Asian Heritage Cultural Group at GameStart, and 6 million of them live here. And so you're you're fairly powerful, at least numerically, and you also have a pretty good distribution of resources. You have coal, you have a pretty solid amount of logging, you also have iron. And so you have the three things that you need to start your own industrial loop. And so unlike someone like Siam, for instance, who literally cannot industrialize without joining somebody else's market because they, they have 12 coal total and nine iron total, in Siam. So Siam, they can't really industrialize, but you can. You have 27 iron here, you have 24 coal, 32 coal. You can you can do a lot with Dynam. So if you have a monarchy, the first thing you want to know is can you work with your monarch? In this case, we have a 44-year-old landowner and a 28-year-old landowner, and he's arrogant. Um, so no is sort of the answer. And so what that means is you need to come up with a plan to end your monarchy. In order to end your monarchy, you're going to need to make some pretty serious changes to your laws, however. And so just looking over your laws, it should be pretty clear that you are like a lot of the other landowner nations. You just have a bunch of bad landowner laws all over the place, and that means you have a lot of law work that you need to do. And so you do need to prioritize having reasonable amount of legitimacy, because you, you can't pass laws in 1.1.2 if you have less than 25 legitimacy. So you can't just have whoever you want in government. You need to have a plan. At the moment, my recommendation is to re-roll your landowner until you get Jingoist. You can do this. If you don't have the patience for that and you want to just re-roll into a pacifist, that works too. But I think, generally speaking, Jingoist is going to be a lot stronger for you as, as Vietnam. It's going to let you win civil wars pretty easily, actually, by being in, in professional army. I'm also going to recommend that you bolster the Mahayana monks and the intelligentsia, because both of those are going to be pulling pops from the landowner, and therefore they're going to be pulling the clout that's associated with those pops away from the landowner. Eventually, you're going to want to switch off of either Buddhist monks or intelligentsia to suppressing landowners, but at the beginning of the game, these guys are 60% of your clout, plus they're your head of state. You can't make a government without them, and so you you just need to deal with what you've got. Then you also have a lot of stuff that you can do in terms of your budget. Your budget's very big, so you can afford to run a couple of construction sectors. I recommend spacing them out so that way you don't have input good shortages, because you don't have an infinite amount of wood in your in your market. But if you space out your construction sectors, you can get like two to four with Dynam without having any sort of issues up front. You can also afford to run a couple of consumption taxes if you want to. But because you start with an imperious monarch, you actually benefit a lot from just dumping decrees on your states and just trying to get them up and going as quickly as possible. If you need to move authority out of your decrees and into your consumption taxes, you absolutely can. Um, but run high government wages for sure. High government wages is going to give you a little bit of extra authority, and because of the way that the popularities and all these things are, are linked together, you just want to make sure that you have the maximum number of of decrees that you can drop down. You can also increase your military wages if you need to, but if, you're, if your armed forces are going to be providing you with a military tech cost bonus, then that's all you really need there. As long as you're covered, military wages at medium is fine. If you're in a real fight with an enemy, don't be afraid to go up to high or very high, but don't put the money there initially. When it comes to your construction, I'm going to recommend that you just plow, plow straight ahead, start an industrial loop, because you can get construction sectors, logging camps, tooling workshops, and then iron, and then run pig iron tools, and you can use your and you can use your tools in your logging camps, and you can just very rapidly industrialize. In terms of your market, because you do have trade, unlike Japan, who starts in isolationism, you don't. You start in mercantilism, which is good for your corn laws, but also means that you need to be careful in regards to the way you set up your tariffs. My recommendation is to set up protect domestic supply on most of the things that you are going to want to hold on to, like your wood and your fabric, or protect domestic supply on the things that you want people to sell to you, because then 
they won't have to pay as much to dump those into your market, which at the beginning of the game is going to be helpful. And of course, you also have trade routes, so don't be afraid to, to buy guns if you need to. Your army can't currently use them because we haven't hit the technologies yet, but you you can use artillery, you can use cannons. At the beginning of the game, you actually don't have any generals, but I we just saw one and recruited them. So go ahead and check in here if you have any generals with specifically, the, you see the ideology here, it says pacifist. So you're looking specifically for theocrats, republicans, or abolitionists. Republicans are gonna help you because they're gonna support ending your monarchy. They're also gonna support ending hereditary bureaucracy, which is really bad, um, and so republicans a plus, very, very helpful. Abolitionists are going to be in favor of ending serfdom and slavery, which are, of course, two of the biggest things helping to prop up the landowner. Whereas the theocrat is also going to endorse ending your monarchy in favor of a theocracy. And so getting those personal ideologies into the leadership here, which by getting them onto your generals doesn't ensure that they're going to get into your leadership, but helps prioritize them for leadership positions. It's going to be really helpful for you because you want to have as many of your, your IGs supporting the end of your monarchy as possible because these guys they're terrible they got to get out of here but be aware that theocrats and republicans don't play particularly well with each other so there it's kind of one or the other but abolitionists these are going to be across the board useful for you as i mentioned you do have like just an enormous amount of authority and it's going to be really inexpensive for you plus your budget at least initially isn't that bad so you can just plop down a bunch of decrees everywhere the more that you develop your economy of course the more consumption taxes are going to be become more useful. But at the beginning of the game, like services minus 200 authority for 1.29k, you can just click very high taxes if you need that. We can add 2.51k in, in extra money by just clicking up here. And so using your authority where you have it, and in this case, we're just going to use promoting social mobility everywhere in Dynom, at least initially, because it'll help our tech spread a little bit. And we do need a lot of technology. Have a one a one X copy of road maintenance that you move around. And then I have right now agricultural industry throughput, but I'm not aiming to leave it as that. I'm, I'm looking here actually probably to encourage manufacturing in Tonkin and resource extraction in Anam, because I'm gonna try to build up Tonkin into my industrial base because I do have 500,000 peasants here almost, and I'm looking to build Anam into my resource extraction base because this is my source of iron. And so going ahead and planning that division out is going to be really helpful for you. But in the meantime, you wouldn't get any, because right now you wouldn't get anything from using the, uh, the better decrees at the moment. Diplomatically, you do actually have a tributary in the form of Cambodia. And so if you can get away with just turning them directly into a vassal, they're going to cost almost no infamy. And so the question of whether or not you can vassalize Cambodia kind of depends on on who is going to intervene on their behalf. If the East India Company intervenes on their behalf, that might not be the end of the world because the EIC doesn't have a land border over there. It just, but if like a great power intervenes and starts naval invading you, then it can be annoying. So just pay attention to who's in the Diplo play. In regards to your diplomacy here, don't exclusively focus on Southeast Asia though, because if you can get a 10 stack of navy somewhere, you can project force all over the place, right? As, as soon as you get down to Napoleonic Warfare, then you can thrash basically anyone you come across. And even if you aren't in Napoleonic Warfare, if you have line infantry and uh, cannon artillery on your barracks, then you should be able to beat most nations with a 10 stack. So just position yourself well in regards to where you're going to set up this extra interest, and you'll get extra interest the more that you grow and so just prioritize finding places where there aren't going to be great powers that are going to intervene against you when you're ready to to do naval invasions because it's going to be pretty strong when you can start puppeting or directly annexing things obviously focusing in southeast asia and indonesia is going to be better for you because those pops are going to be more similar to your own but that doesn't mean that you should neglect invading zulu right if you can get it so that the british aren't belligerent on you, which, um, well, maybe we'll improve relations there. Uh, but if you can get it so the British aren't gonna intervene when you invade Zulu, then maybe you go there. So if you can get it so the French wouldn't resist you, then maybe you 
invade Madagascar. Just be aware that as Dynam with 6.3 million starting pops, you're very powerful. Technologically, I think that even though you don't start with urban planning, I think that you desperately need to get your intelligentsia up and going. So I'm going to recommend that you go ahead and you get Academia as your first technology. That'll allow you to build universities, which will dramatically increase the strength of your intelligentsia. And so get yourself Academia and then plop down probably a two stack of university here, because that's all you need in order to trigger your journal entry that you'll get equal to or greater than two. So that's all you need. And then that'll let you get extra tech points onto empiricism, which is going to be really helpful long term. Because again, you're gonna you're gonna need to end your, your monarchy. From there it's gonna be primarily the same strategy that we employed as the Mandate of Heaven, where we tried to provoke a civil war with the the uh, the landowners. In this case we used theocracy, but you can use you can use whatever you have available to you in order to provoke this civil war. But by making sure that we have access to the guns in the capital, because we have the arms industry there, and by making sure that we are the only people with barracks, and by, and by making sure that we are in professional army, and therefore they can't conscript very well, we should be able to have a pretty significant military advantage, especially if we did manage to to vassalize Cambodia. And in this game, we when we went to vassalize them, they just backed down. And so we, we should have way more than enough strength to just punch through this aristocratic revolt, which is gonna dramatically redistribute power inside of the country by suppressing all of the landowner clout. But yeah, we're just we're just gonna plow through these guys. Because we, we have guns, they don't. You can switch the methods of production on their conscription centers right before they revolt, and that'll give them that'll give them an equipment adjustment penalty. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty good. It it's gonna be a costly civil war. That's the only meaningful downside really for us. But it's it's gonna be pretty easy to pay off. Because we can all we can always turn on a bunch of consumption taxes, right? There it is, we've put down the, the landowners, which has given us a huge bonus to our, our power here with the Mahayana monks. And of course, if, if you can hit your role for theocracy while you have um, your, your landowners being suppressed, then you can guarantee that you have your pick of the litter when it comes to, to whoever you put in charge here. So we put in charge the Mahayana monks. Um, he is a, a wildly unpopular leader due to being a hedonist bandit, so I don't know why I don't know why that was the character that they decided to put in charge, um, but that's okay. It, a non-landowner is better than anybody else. And so now we have a non-landowner in charge, we can bring in the rural folk, and with the rural folk in there, you can do serfdom abolished. If we can do serfdom abolished, by the way, then this will make the landowners a lot less a lot less scary when they come back. We're not gonna have the, the resources to industrialize quite as as quickly as some other people. But by if you can succeed there on that on that theocracy role, or if you can see it on your second theocracy role, if you have to have another civil war, then you can position yourself where you can use Mahayana monks and rural folk for a while. And if you can use those two together, then you can get some some extra work done, like you can get out of serfdom abolished, which is the most important thing, because eventually this loser and revolutionary struggle penalty is going to wear off and the landowners are going to come back. At that point, once the landowners are back, you may end up needing to use corn laws, but that's okay. Using corn laws is not going to be that hard and that complicated as Dynam, and in fact, I think it's going to be really advantageous for you, because you're not going to have an infinite amount of bureaucracy laying around, and so switching into laissez-faire and, I think, for that matter, free trade is going to be pretty helpful for you because the trade route bureaucracy cost for a small country that doesn't have a lot of resources is way more important than having the ability to enact small tariffs. It really is. And I'm going to demonstrate that in a different video when we play Luxembourg. But basically, don't worry about the fact that people are going to be buying your clothes. That's a feature, not a bug, because that'll that'll help get extra money from the world at large into the hands of the textile mills or the lumber yards or whatever, right? Because you have a finite amount of demand locally, but there's an infinite amount of money out here. And so free trade can bring a lot of attention to you in Dynam. It can really help uh, your economy. So getting into, getting into corn laws is going to be really helpful for you, very powerful, and I think the easiest way to do it right now, at least in patch 1.1.2, is with a civil war. With the legitimacy rework, it's just gotten a lot more difficult to be able to politically outmaneuver the landowners, and so my recommendation on, at least in patch 1.1, is to just fight them. That's Walker, that's, uh, that's Dynam, that's a, a basic country guide. We didn't really do a whole lot of imperializing, but most of the things that you want to be doing in the first decade 
as one of these landowner countries, unless you have really, really weak neighbors, is internal development. Because there's so much stuff that you need to change. Like, we still have 74% peasants. If you can get them onto iron frame buildings, even just a little bit of them onto iron frame buildings, like if you if you have a level 1 in Anam in iron frame and a level 3 in Tonkin on wood that you want to get into to iron frame, that's fine, right? You're, you're developing an economy from the ground up here in Dynam. It gives you a lot of influence over the direction of the country. All right, that's Walker, and that's our Dynam basic country guide. Take care.